Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dan Pratt from A Start Farms in Hadley. Um, Dan, take it away. Take Thank it away. you all for having me. Um, a Starty Farm is a certified organic uh, market garden just a few miles, actually a few paces west of the Fort River watershed. Uh, it's a market garden that sells primarily to the two River Valley markets in Northampton and East Hampton, several local chefs, and we have about a 35 members CSA. Uh, my official title is Farm Graybeard. I used to own the farm. I sold it to a really nice man named Jim Mead from Amherst. He and his daughter, Amelia, have taken over the place and I continue to act uh, as a consultant, basically show up and tell them what they're doing wrong once or twice a week. Um, the methods we use eliminate all the harmful effects of tillage and allow our really diverse soil microbiology to fully engage with the minerals and organic matter that is already present in our soils. The resultant vigorous plant growth is naturally resistant to pests and diseases and provides a richness of flavor that mirrors our higher nutritional profiles. Um, there, there's some confusion about the term no-till because like so many things in this world, no-till can mean many things. And just as in, the, as in the word certified organic can also mean many things, um, I'd really like to differentiate us from those more general terms. You'll hear no-till used um, pretty much in the Midwest for someone that goes in and herbicides a field, uses a no-till planter, puts corn in. Um, it's, it's a very chemical intensive method of uh, agriculture that really doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing over on Astarte. Um, there's really um, there's really no comparison between those monocrop giant acreage systems and what we've got, which is really what I call a market garden. I have to specify that in Hadley because if I called myself a farmer in Hadley, they'd laugh me off Route Nine. You know, three and a half acres. That's where some people turn their tractors around. So it's, it's a different thing altogether. And it has a lot of um, carryover to sort of home gardeners. And there's a lot of potential for home gardeners to adopt some of these no-till practices that we use. And it's of great benefit uh, for your soil ecology, for the amount of runoff that occurs in any kind of garden. And uh, we have had, we've had great luck with it there in the last six years. We're just approaching our seventh year of um, cover cropping on that place. Basically what we've got is a compost based systems. And once again, there's a word like compost. It sounds like it's one thing, but no two composts are alike. We're all the time looking for compost that the organic uh, certification groups will allow us to use, but still have as much diversity in their feedstocks as possible. Uh, we really like it if we can find something with some animal manures that's been used in there. But in the current state of things, we've really sort of fallen back onto the lowest common denominator of compost, which is grass clippings and yard waste. Um, it's really one of the weird things about the organic certification system is you can't call what you make compost if you're not following EPA regulations for uh, municipal compost operations. And that's the amount of turning and feedstock uh, listing and, and on and on. So some of, the, some of the techniques that we use, we do a lot of grown in place mulch. So we will grow a crop of say oats and peas and then we will either mow that closely to the ground or if it gets tall enough, we will use a crop roller and we'll actually roll that down so that we have the mulch, really it's just grown in place. Um, another technique that we've had a lot of luck with has been interplanting. That's also known as companion planting. And the idea here is instead of just growing uh, tomatoes, you'll have tomatoes with a row of, uh, basil right beside it and maybe another row on the other shoulder of lettuce 
and you've got all of these different root systems working together uh, again in the soil that we've worked with, which has become much more fungally active than you would find in a soil that's been tilled. If you watch uh, anybody plowing a field or disking a field in Hadley, you'll see the tremendous churning that occurs. Soil is literally, I mean, they call it breaking the ground and it, it does break the ground. It completely disrupts all of the fungal activity in your soils. And it's actually those fungal mycelii that get in there and perform almost magic tricks mediating the soil and the and the plants and it's working with these little tiny plant roots micro plant roots that you can hardly see exchanging sugars and carbons it's it, it really just a wonderful wonderful system but if you use a rototiller if you even get in there with a spading fork and just break up all your soil in your home garden you've actually destroyed those networks and they are uh, crucial to making soil uh, really grow healthy crops. So in addition to interplanting, we also use quite a few shredded leaves. We have a couple of organic, um, uh, you know, guys that go in and clean up lawns and, and bring us basically, it's already been through a lawnmower, so it's shredded and we like to use those just as a sheet mulch. We use cardboard and wood chips. Because we're certified organic, we can only use cardboard that has black ink on it, no colored inks whatsoever. We spend a lot of time taking uh, plastic uh, tape off of the cardboard, but it does a super job when we have a real bad weed situation to lay down a layer of cardboard, cover it with wood chips, which keeps the wood keeps the cardboard in place. And again, you've got only fungus that's digesting the wood chips. So it's sort of an additional boost to the fungal activities in your soil. Some people are really worried about wood chips because they've heard that it will rob all the nitrogen out of their soil. We do try to age our wood chips for at least six months and we would prefer a year. But the fact of the matter is if you don't stir those wood chips in, if you leave them on the surface of the soil, all of that robbing of nitrogen is happening right there at the very point of contact. And as soon as it's been robbed, it's very quickly rotted and released right back into the soil. And some of the nicest soil on our farm is where we've had wood chips down now for two or three years. We also use paper mulches. You can buy paper mulches by the roll. We love it when we're planting the garlic. If we can get some rolls of paper with the correct hole spacing for the garlic, you can lay down a thin layer of compost, roll the paper out on top of it, plant your garlic, cover it again with compost. Does just a wonderful job all through the winter. The other main techniques that we use are um, ground cover occultation strips. Ground cover is that black woven, some people call it weed mat, uh, you really want to make sure that you've got an inert uh, substance that you're using there if you're certified organic. The nice thing about it is it lets water and oxygen through so you have a lot of uh, soil biological activity that continues under the strips. Now being a farm and being human beings we do occasionally run into situations where we let the weeds get out of hand. In those cases we will sometimes use solarization Solarization is clear plastic, like we use on our high tunnels and our propagation greenhouse. And we lay that out over a problem area, try to seal the edges as good as possible, sometimes just with T-posts, sometimes literally digging a ditch and burying the edge of the plastic in there. And timing is everything. You wanna do that just before you get three hot sunny days. Doesn't work very well in the rain, but boy, when the sun is out, it does a great job. And the third or last technique that we use is silage tarps. These are very heavy black plastic with a white, uh, white alternative side. And we roll them out with the black side up and those can often stay on the ground for up to six months. It's just a smother, if you will, for the weeds. There's nowhere to go. They come up under the black plastic and they die. I'm really less happy with the last two techniques. I'm not as crazy about having plastic on the farm. 
as any kind of uh, organic material that we can get. But in a bad situation, it, it sure beats uh, fighting the weeds the following 10 years. For tools for farming, no-till, we use a, a roller crimper for terminating these cover crops. It's actually a drum with uh, angle iron welded to it, and we just roll that stuff down. It m puts multiple crimps into the stem of a winter rye or an oat, will not allow it to regrow. It's great for when you've got that taller cover crop that you want to terminate. When we have a shorter cover crop, we'll often use a flail mower. A flail mower is distinct from any other kind of mulching mower. Instead of like the blade going round and round this way, it's a drum that rotates this way and it drops all of that green chop matter right down on top of your bed. Uh, we've used that with, with great success. Again, sort of in that grow your own mulch, mulch in place type of bed. Uh, the last tool is the drop compost spreader. We have one that's hydraulically driven off of the tractor. So we can vary the tractor speed with the speed of the drop spreader. We can go between a half inch to almost two and a half inches of compost at the exact width of our bed. That also is a fairly expensive item. Uh, they make them for home growers. that are just a drum made out of uh, a wide mesh uh, metal and you just shovel your compost in there and push the drum and as it rolls it allows a metered amount of compost down onto your bed. So some of the benefits that we see from the uh, no-till situation that we're using, we, we really like the soil health aspects that we're seeing. We're seeing a lot more macro and micro soil health. So our earthworm population has greatly imp improved. We've got what's called ground beetles. Ground beetles are voracious uh, weed seed eaters, and they uh, really don't like to have the soil disturbed. Um, we get a much better fungal bacterial uh, soil balance, so we have healthier plants. Um, we're really, we're allowing the soil's in, inherent fertility just to produce our crops. We have absolutely no mineral inputs whatsoever. We're not adding any phosphorus. We're not adding any potassium. We're not adding any nitrogen. We're just relying on the little bit of a biological boost we get from compost applications. And it's, uh, it's really been producing some nice crops. Now, preservation of soil nesting invertebrates. This is like, a, you know, you don't even think about this, but if you have bare soil on your farm that isn't disturbed, you will have wasps coming down and grabbing a little bit of that to take home to their paper wasp nest. You'll have bumblebees nesting in the ground for the following year. And again, these ground beetles, which are tremendous helpers for us. Uh, we've also seen a, a gradual changeover from annual weeds, which is what we had predominantly on that farm, to more uh, perennial weeds. And that, that might not sound that good, but what it means is, is the weeds aren't moving around quite as fast as they were. And you actually have the potential to do some weed mapping either in your garden or on your farm because you know, okay, this, this is where that one is. And it, it came up again the next year and it's a little easier to uh, get rid of. Now, the biggest, the biggest benefits that we see are drought resistance. We've had some wicked years on the farm since we went no-till and we've just got so much more soil organic matter. It's like little black sponges out there. It's soaking up every bit of moisture it can get and then releasing it as the ground starts to dry out. We have much more um, moisture retained because of the surface mulches that we use. So we use uh, winter rye on the, uh, on the garlic and anywhere where we can afford to use it, quite frankly, and any kind of a layer like the shredded leaves, the cardboard and wood chips, it all is really helping to keep that moisture in the soil. And then we see really much better root structures on the plants that we're growing because the soil is looser and it can penetrate, the plants can penetrate with their roots further, 
Further, there's more soil moisture and we get uh, more consistent growth through the droughts. Another thing we really like is the downpour resistance. There have been just some incredible rainy weeks this year and we just don't see any runoff because we've got wormholes and beetle holes and all kinds of stuff. The soil organic matter again to soak up that moisture and it's doing a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of that. We also don't see what's called armoring or compaction of the soil surface when we have mulches in place. So when those raindrops are pounding on the soil, they can actually compact the surface of the soil and make it more difficult for rain to penetrate and be absorbed. Um, the last thing is less spo soil splashing. Soil being splashed up on your plants. I mean, we love our soil, but it's also loaded with the uh, pathogens. We don't want to see it on the tomato leaves. We don't want to see it on the uh, lettuce leaves. So anytime we can get a mulch in there, right around the base of the plant, we know that we're going to have a healthier plant that's going to be longer, longer living. And I'm probably going long, but I just want to talk about drawbacks because it's not a perfect world. Direct seeding can be way more difficult in a no-till situation. Instead of having a white, fluffy, tilled piece of ground to work with, we usually end up putting compost on the surface of the soil and direct seeding into that. When we can't do that, then we have to fall back on transplants. Transplants are more expensive. They require more labor. We're also using you know, potting soil and everything else. Uh, the real advantage with a transplant, of course, is you get a two or three week head start on the weeds. And we love that. Uh, hand weeding labor versus mechanical cultivation. There is a lot of cultivation that goes on in this valley. And if you ever see it done on a hot, dry day, you will see the soil blowing away. I hate, I hate steel in the field. I would really rather see someone on their hands and knees doing that hand weeding that's necessary to cut down on the competition for your plants. Uh, it also is a wonderful source of compost starter because you've got a green plant with all kinds of dirt on the roots and you stick that in your compost, you can get it to heat right up quickly. Uh, pathway maintenance can also be a downside because we've had grass paths that requires a lot of mowing. Mowing requires, uh, you know, more carbon input into your, uh, into your machine. We've used cardboard and wood chips. Uh, we've used other mulches when available. Uh, and it all is more maintenance than if you're just going to go in there and tear up the surface of the soil uh, with a cultivating tractor. So it kind of comes down in my mind to, would you rather see two people with tractors farming 300 acres, which is done all the time? Or would you rather see 30 10 acre farms with each one employing five people? I mean, I really think people need to get more in touch with where their food comes from. And if there was a lot more farmers on a lot more small farms, which it's happening in the Valley, I'm happy to say. And I think that, that that's reflected in a lot of the uh, local, buy local, grow local things that are going on here. So that's my personal uh, outlook on that. Lastly, just the, the vibrant soil on this farm, it really translates into improved flavor and also surprisingly better keeping conditions. Our stuff lasts better in a refrigerator than a lot of other people's uh, produce. And I really believe it's just because it has so much life the moment it's picked. Mm. Uh, carbon sequestration is gonna be a major issue as we continue to go through the climate crisis. And I'm really hoping that small farms with no-till um, techniques can help pull a lot of that nitrogen back into the soil. And of course, because it's a watershed, I have to talk about runoff. And really with no-till, you have way, way less runoff and uh, it's better for everybody. Thank you kindly. Oh, Dan, thanks so much. That's so inspirational. And I can attest uh, personally that the spinach and the garlic were just like unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just knock your socks off. And They're so good. 
I also apologize because I was going to put together a, uh, a slideshow, but I wasn't able to, <laughs> to be heard. So we didn't go very far with the slideshow. And if anybody wants to come out to the farm, I'm happy to give personal tours uh, and, and show you what we're doing out there. That's a great opportunity. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm not sure that you actually covered it, but uh, would you say that like the methods that you're using overall require less input to the, to the field, uh, you know, relative to the output you're getting? Like, how does that, how does it affect that aspect of, uh, of yield? I'm not sure that we've done any uh, qualitative analysis of that, to tell you the truth. Um, the thing I can tell you is we don't use any mineral fertilizers. We don't use mm -hmm. any rock powders, right. none of that. We're really relying on the inherent mineral fertility in our soils and then unlocking it with this increased biological activity. Okay. If you counted all of the pounds of... Uh, winter rye and uh, wood chips and cardboard. I, I honestly don't know how that, would, how that would work out. So maybe the inputs really translate into uh, more into labor. Oh, there's a lot uh, more labor. Than, than it would be chemicals. And, and so that might be seen as a drawback from the point of view of productivity, you know, and stuff like that. But I agree with you. I, I would choose the latter of those two scenarios, the small farms with more people working on them. Uh, I think that like the whole, this is kind of getting out of the watershed idea, but it dovetails with, with the whole idea of labor and, you know, dignity of work and stuff like that. Um, I think that uh, kind of is, is another upside. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with you. And, and it's not a, it's not a done deal over there. We're still developing these techniques mm -hmm. and uh, the profitability has been marginal at best. Mm 